In 2015, we celebrated 50 years of anthropology in Bergen by establishing an annual Frederick Bath honorary lecture. Frederick Bath died a few months after this first Frederick Bath lecture, and we're very happy to know and experience that, um, that he knew and experienced that we inaugurated an annual public lecture in his name. In doing so, we wished to praise and honour Bath and make a platform for communicating anthropology. The scholar invited to give the lecture will present some of the trademarks of Frederick Bath's anthropological scholarship. The development of theory, grounded in solid ethnography and based on participant observation, as well as compassion to comparison. The invited scholar can be young or established, but should in some way or another be concerned in his or her work with the regions and topics explored by Frederick Bath. When Bath arrived in Bergen, one of his first projects was a research on entrepreneurs and social change in northern Norway. This culminated in the publication of a rather small book in 1963 called The Role of the Entrepreneurs in Social Change in Northern Norway, and it was published by Universitas Bologna. But reasoning for this endeavor is quoted in Olaf Smeda's chapter in the newly publi published edited volume, Anthropology in Norway. Bath explained, and I quote, I regarded it as basic to the nature of anthropology to do cross-cultural and international research. So my task was to create a greater public awareness of the enormous value and contemporary relevance of active international research. But I also needed to promote empirical work within Norway, because showing this form of relevance was no doubt important to the general reception of anthropology there, or rather here. Taking my brief from the Tavistock Institute in London and their industrial studies of task organisation in coal mining in England, I launched a study of task organisation in herring fishing with Pursue Sand, which is Snurpinut, along the west coast of Norway, and also a cooperative study of the role of entrepreneurs in social change in northern Norway, end of quote. Six years after this, in 1969, Bath edited the volume Ethnic Groups and Boundaries, The Social Organization of Cultural Difference, published also by Universitas Bologna. The volume's ethnographic attention to how people could change their ethnic identity introduced a new perspective on ethnicity, <coughs> focusing on social boundaries. The discovery procedures included a refocus away from questions of cultural differences to that of social organisation of those differences. And that it seems very obvious today that ethnic identity is about self-ascription and ascription by others in interaction, and that trying to study ethnic identity uh, merely by looking at one group is like trying to listen to one hand clapping is a clear sign of the volume's influence on our anthropological habitus. It is worth mentioning, of course, that Bath also developed this uh, approach to ethnic identity in his later work. It is particularly the continued and changed relevance of these two aspects of Bath's anthropology, his field in Northern Norway, and Bath's influential perspective on how we understand ethnicity, their resonances, with the current work of Marianne Lea, and which we will hear in her Bath lecture today. Marianne Lea has conducted fieldwork in various places in Norway, in addition to Australia, Tasmania. In her former research, she has been concerned with the politics of food, domestication, particularly in the fieldwork of aquaculture and multi-species relations and homemaking, or rather cottage making in Norway. And some of her students are very familiar with her book, Hytta, Fire Vägar und den Dröm, The Cottage, Four Walls Around a Dream, which she wrote together with Simon Agra. At the beginning of the corona crisis, Mariana's research in the Norwegian cottage became highly relevant, in fact. One of the first responses to lockdown was Norwegians fleeing to seek shelter in the cottage, a practice which was then prohibited, if only for a while, by the Norwegian government. And in this period of crisis, which almost became a crisis of the cottage, Mariana was regularly to be heard on the radio and seen on TV, even on prime time on a Saturday evening. 
where she was explaining to the public and to the government the cultural and social position of the cottage in Norwegian identity and in times of crisis. This public engagement and drive to reach out with anthropological perspectives and knowledge to a wider audience was also an important endeavour of Frederick Bath. In Marianne's, uh, Marianne Lien's Bath lecture, we will today return to Northern Norway, to sites in Finnmark, <coughs> and to questions of ethnic identity. Like Bath, Marianne Lien has conducted fieldwork in Northern Norway, and from this site, she will draw our attention to processes and politics of colonization and other atrocities. She's, she will offer us a multiple temporal ethnography, providing a perspective on what artifacts, material, archival, human, and botanical remains can tell us about how subjectivities and ethnic identities are made and unmade. And, unmade. and a very short note on this ritual of bath lecture, so that you all know what to expect. So we have the tradition that there will be no Q&A after the bath lecture has been given. The title of the 2021 Frederick Bath Memorial Lecture is Beyond the Ethnographic Presence, Landscapes as Relational Archives. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mariana Lea. Thank you. Um, does this work in the microphone? Yeah. Thanks for a very generous uh, uh, introduction, Sinema. And um, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. It's a, it's a huge honor. It's, a, it's humbling. And um, well, I hope to deliver in a way that Frederick Barth would not uh, be too ashamed of. Um, one of the ways in which Frederick Barth has shaped Norwegian anthropology is through his insistence on the value of ethnographic fieldwork. We share this. It is our legacy. International evaluations on Norwegian anthropology have consistently pointed to ethnographic fieldwork as one of its strengths. And I think they're right. And I think that we owe this to a large extent to Frederick Barth, to his theoretical approach and his teaching over the years. So this will be a lecture about fieldwork and social change. I'll talk about time, temporality, and Frederick Barth's actually rather crazy radical idea that if you want to understand social change, you can do it and you should do it through fieldwork in the present. Fieldwork, of course, is a great approach for understanding social life, as we all know, and as anthropologists have advocated since Malinowski. It is great for understanding how religion, politics, kinship, and the rest are connected. There is probably no other way. Um, and it's great for getting a sense of social organization or social form. But Frederick Barth was not so interested in social form as such. He was interested in the generation of social form, in the multiple dynamic processes that together shape what we experience as social and cultural life. And the radicalness of his approach, I suggest, is not only that his generative theoretical model for social change, but that he actually advocated fieldwork on what I would call a presentist methodological approach for understanding social change. So in this lecture, I'll take you to Finnmark, my old field site, um, such as Spotsfjord and Syltefjord on the Varangir coastline that I visited on and off since my first fieldwork in 1985. And as I prepared this, um, a certain Schalkiger quote came to mind. Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived uh, forwards. Uh, and the same, I think, goes for ethnographic fieldwork, sometimes only fully grasped looking back. Um, it matters what ideas you use to think other ideas with. Originally coined by Marilyn Stether, this phrase has been part of a playful exchange <coughs> between her and Donna Haraway and others. It matters what relations you use to think other relations with. It matters what things you use to think other things with, and so on and so forth. And here you see some of the things that I will be thinking Frederick Barth's ideas with. And because Barth was such a great thinker, Rethinking his ideas throughout his entire career, it totally matters what Frederick Barth used to think other ideas with. I have chosen his work from the late 1960s, when the uh, Models of Social Organization that you see here um, was published. And this is the era that also shaped anthropological understandings of ethnic relations in Finland. He, has, he was always there in the background, as I think for everyone trained in anthropology during the 70s, 80s, or 90s. My own first book-like monograph, 
from a book, Nafesk de Pizza, Susukukile de Endlinger, Amato and Ribotsu, from 1987, is a study actually of social change through the lens of food. How food related social transactions generally aggregate changes in eating patterns. I don't think I used exactly those terms, but it was a thinking totally um, inspired and formed by that way, that idea. And as you have said, ethnicity gets its shape in the encounter. We learned that. And because these encounters are social, they can be observed as they unfold. This is what we taught, maybe still teach. This is why I did not write about Sami in Botsville, because there weren't any. I asked, of course, but some of this was elsewhere. They said, we're not here. There were no such ethnic encounters that I could observe, not, I mean, a single one. Okay. Um, in Models of Social Organization from 66, and in the follow up article in American Anthropologist, Barth launched the theory of generative models focusing on process. This is a little bit uh, very familiar to some of you, but we are young and old here, so let me just reiterate a little bit. He says, um, Our contribution as social anthropologists must lie in the powers of observation out there where change is happening today, not secondary data, not historical records. The task he articulated for us was to study a uh, process as it unfolds in the present in front of our eyes. And this is why I play with the term ethnographic presentism, inspired by Gudrun Shalom over there, um, who defends her thesis very soon on this topic. And she writes about presentism as a temporality over time, characterized by the attention to the current moment without interest in what lies behind or what is to come. Social form, he argued, was an epiphenomenon of other processes. And our task was to show how forms were generated. And most of us today, do not pursue generative models of social change, I think. We have other research agendas. We have a number of different research agendas. But the methods remain more or less intact. We agree about this. Being there in the same place at the same time, some stay at the head, some tea at the head, is what we try to achieve. And we might actually, as I will argue, see this as an example of evidentiary optimism. The idea that we can trust our ethnographic gaze and that truth will unfold if we can only be present and use our eyes well. And this has shaped, has shaped I think, generations of anthropological scholars, and perhaps especially in Norway, as well as the understanding of ethnic identities in Finnmark. There are, of course, many other reasons for doing fieldwork. Ethnographic fieldwork makes us good storytellers. Retelling stories of other people's lives renders thick descriptions. And it is precisely through being there and being when, some tea they had, some stay they had, that we achieve the thick descriptions that we look for. It's often said that while the theoretical significance of an anthropological monograph fades with time, it is the ethnographic stories that linger, that make the work, uh, what can you say, at all, that it's time, you know, last through the, through the generations. But then, it is not quite as simple as this graffiti painted on a derelict house in Bordre that everything is a story. Some stories are never told, some truths remain hidden even for the ethnographer. So, what remains of ethnographic fieldwork when the aim is no longer primarily to produce generative models of social change? What might be lost when the method becomes a mantra for what anthropology is? Or when the quality of fieldwork is measured by how long it took you, rather than what you actually did there, or what it yielded of insight, what did you actually do, understanding, what sort of understanding and effective relations were generated out of it. These are questions I think about as I now return to fieldwork, uh, to feel my for fieldwork over and over again. Let me begin uh, by a brief um, interlude. In a retrospective film published in 2016, the elderly professor is asked about his most enjoyable fieldwork experience. I think it was recorded uh, a little, a few years before, maybe. Barth then immediately selects his fieldwork among the Basri, pastoral nomads of southern Persia, where he spent eight months in the late 1950s. But what made it so enjoyable? There is a moment in this otherwise sober interview when his eyes light up, his lips curl, as he raises his hands toward his neck to indicate the position of a newborn lamb. I want to share this with you. It's a, a two, three minutes of film. 
So uh, we will then have a shift, and the technicians will miraculously help us, I think. For eight months, from 1957 to 1958, Bart did research along the Basari, pastoral nomads of South Persia. At a time when Middle Eastern governments were trying to get their nomad citizens to settle, Bart started thinking about what specific features led a few nomads to settle, but many others to continue as they were. The idea of generative processes came to influence later works on pastoralism and sedentarization. You've said to us that the period of the Basari was in certain ways your most enjoyable of your many fieldwork periods. Now, what made it so enjoyable? The combination of being in this really extraordinarily beautiful landscape, together with large herds of animals, and uh, particularly sheep. We, they are very innocent, they're very lovely animals. And then the other part of it was the Basari themselves, who were such gentle people in many ways, and uh, artistic, poetic, uh, romantic, and then being in that landscape. The southern, southern Zagros Mountains are quite dramatic mountains, but wide open in an, in, in, in an environment of stunning beauty. And to move through that with the animal herds, living close to the animals, helping at the birth of the lambs. The first couple of days we would carry the lambs because they couldn't move on migration. And we'd hang them over our neck, you know, karakuli lambskin, and a warm beating heart against your neck as you rode with this thing slung over your shoulders. And there were a lot of joys like that, simply in being with them. What's in... Okay. <laughs> Immediately after this brief interview, you asks about the theoretical achievements of the Bessery book, and Bar's face turns serious again. And we hear about sheep as stock, beautiful landscapes as carrying capacity, and effective human-animal relations as part of a pastoral adaptation. Except none of the words, of course, that I just said. And yet, I just love this effective interlude, which gives us a glimpse of the other figure part behind the text. It is indicative of the ways in which the visual media occasionally offers a crack into something which is otherwise left in shadows. It is also indicative of how an anthropocentric notion of sociality has rendered relations between humans and non-human -human beings far more instrumental than they might in fact have been, even for the ethnographer. So, now let's return to Finnmark. In the rest of this lecture, I'll take you there. I'll draw attention to temporality in and on landscapes. I'm interested in how things come together in place and how these co-presences challenge our understanding of social change by presenting layers of heterogeneous time. This is what, what I try to get at through the notion of landscapes as relational archives. I share Bob's interest in social change, but my approach is different. And I'm inspired here by many contemporary writers and current and former students. For landscapes and archives, I'm indebted to, to Laura Ogden and her most recent book, Loss and Wonder of the World Sense, but also the work of Gaston Goradil on constellations. Um, so consider, for example, in a birch forest in the Basvik Valley, that I visited just a couple of months ago. I had gathered a multidisciplinary group, multidisciplinary group of scholars, mostly anthropologists, but a few others, and including archaeologist Stein Fastenhol. And as we stand there in the forest, he points to a rock pile that indicates to him an illegal East Sami winter settlement from around 1920. For me, it was just some rocks underneath the, 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 the plants there, the, the, the birches. But he thought, this is what it is. And he says, probably they're very last because they were not allowed to be here anymore since the borders to Russia had been drawn 100 years earlier and made this part of the valley a no man's land, seemingly not used by anyone, to add a kind of terra nullius. And only 20 meters away from this almost invisible rock pile, we find another pile of rocks, this time an oven. That's what you see in the picture here. Another oven, more intact, from the camp of the German Luftwaffe, 
Deutsche Luftwaffe, who held Russian prisoners, and it is built in exactly the same way that the bread oven that the East Sami built. And Stein, first of all, is not surprised. This is how they made ovens to bake bread across the entire Karelia, Stein explains. And none of this is spectacular for a historian. We all know that Russian prisoners and German soldiers fought and froze and tried to survive in the winters of 1942 to 44 in this region. And we know that there were thousands of soldiers. And we know that East Sami settled illegally and had their temporary settlements burned by Norwegian school doctor forest guards for decades. And yet this constellation of rocks or rubble, so similar in structure, only 25 meters and 25 years apart, are somehow striking to us as we stand there. And the constellation of rocks and their stories added another layer to an ethnographic moment, which also included an odd collection of scholars, but also a German young boy, 10-year-old, his unvaccinated mother, in exile, who had fled what they saw as an authoritarian COVID regime in Germany to wait out the pandemic in a more remote place, in Europe's northernmost back country. Accompanied by a local guy who reconstructs the original log houses of the East Sami, Scott Sami, and we could smell fresh timber from his woodshop. We step into other people's lives, mostly unaware of what went on before and what we leave behind. These German soldiers, uh, the, the, the Russian prisoners, I'm sure they didn't know about the East Sami who just left the site. Really do we understand what we're looking at? So why should we care? Can't we just continue, hang out, speak to people? What's wrong with presentism? Can we not just leave the rubble and rocks to the archaeologists to think about? I think maybe not. In an article entitled The Aftermath of Mass Violence, anthropologist Yael Navarro proposes what she calls uh, a negative methodology, a methodology for gaps, voids and hollows in and about sites of mass atrocity, such as when people have been forcefully relocated, imprisoned, killed, starved, sometimes not even buried, let alone described, such as right here in this picture. When those who are present with us today have been injured, shamed, or hurt in ways that make their stories go silent, or they weren't there at the time. Not everything becomes a story. And yet memories remain in bodies, in things half hidden in the landscape, and in the way we are with each other. This is why Navarro proposes caution in relation to what she calls anthropology's positive outlook for evidential presences or evidentiary presentism, as I call it, or evidentiary optimism, as we might also say. And this is why I see a space for rock ovens, birch trees with barbed wire inside of the, of the, of the barge, bark, uh, or a warm beating heart or a curry lamp, as interlocutors in our story, active witnesses of social change, or even generative agents in their own right, collaborating or co-producing whatever challenge we might be looking at. So, now I take it back to where my fieldwork started, more or less. Uh, Syltefjord used to be a small settlement with sheep farming, fishing in the mid um, 1900s, but like so many other places along this northern coastline, people moved, the school closed, and the old houses had now become secondary homes, such as this place where I now spent a lot of time when I'm there, less so in 1985 when I was there for the first time, but also then. Social change can be a process of bending over, giving in, getting by, and forgetting. The agents of change are not always social entrepreneurs. They can be quite powerful in so, and subtle, and sometimes backed by state policy. And none of this necessarily flies in your face during a few months of fieldwork. So, this is a photo from 1958 inside the farm you just saw. The horse Flora will soon be shot. A new era is underway, and Bjarne, standing there posing for the photographer on the hay wagon, is about 30 years old. He is busy now writing letters about tractors, subsidies, and loans. His barn is brand new, he more or less built it himself, and the hopes, his hopes for the future are intertwined with the agronomist's 
promise of the virtues of artificial fertilizer. The photo is, a, I think, a snapshot of social change kind of frozen in time. It is part of a collection of black and white family photos on the living room wall. On another picture, his two-year-old daughter, Vibeke, poses with the same horse. I met Vibeke and her parents in 1985, when she was as old as her father in this picture. And we have been friends ever since. And if Barth would have studied social entrepreneurs in this exact part of Norway, Bjarne would have been his man. Active, able, ambitious. The first one to acquire a tractor, increasing his rock of sheep, and his taxable and deductible income every single year between the 1950s and the 1970s. But this is also a story of failure, of silence, and of being rendered invisible, even to the ethnographer. So it gets a little complicated here, okay? So let me explain. This is a lot of work going into a very small talk, but uh, let me try. Here, these are things I never noticed. Here is a massive Ferguson tractor. More or less idle since the 1970s. You see it inside of the barn that you just saw a picture of. It had been left in the same barn since the 70s. And nobody talked about it until, at least I never heard, until 2015 when they decided to sell it, get rid of it finally. It was about time at Findodeno to a collector in Alta for 4,000 kron. Well, I never knew about this in 85. I discovered it in 2015, okay, a few years later. So, um, the photo on the wall was always there as well. I never really thought about what it could have told me about a recent and abandoned farming practice. I never cared to ask. Until the, until the summer of 2015, when I saw these things, including this plow, rusty, its knives deeply dug into the soil right behind the house, and I realized it must always have been there. Has it actually always been there? Is it just, am I blind? Or, but I wasn't, so, I'm not interested in things like that, really. So, when I finally began to notice these things, uh, it was triggered by uh, another little, so here's another little uh, twist to the story. It was triggered by a phone call, actually, um, one of the many phone calls between Finnmark and, and, and Oslo. A complaint from a friend about the fuel nature reserve and the fact that they could not, no longer cut fire right there because of the nature reserve. And we thought this was pretty crazy because the fire would have been cut forever, generations of fire wood cutting. I mean, you need wood when you live up here, right? It's, it's just ridiculous. So uh, we checked the website, and the website describes the valley in the biologist's word, nearly untouched. The birch forest, nearly untouched. And it is these very provocative words, nearly untouched, that triggered our most recent collaborative ethnographic journey, Vivek and I. Because obviously it was not untouched. But how could they say something like that in Milieu Directorate in 2015? How can they lie like that? And how come I had ignored these recent landscape transformations too? These most extraordinary processes of social change. So our questions were intertwined. Family questions, his local history questions, and my more general anthropological questions that came from a number of different angles and called upon a different approach. So since then we've been working now with Vivek's memory, but also increasingly with landscapes and things, and with landscapes as relational archives. Last year, <coughs> Vibeke found this. I mean, we do influence our, our field, right? So Vibeke has become a very good uh, uh, archival person in her own life. She found this in the basement somewhere. This is Moon. It's called Moon, okay? In its heyday in the 1960s. This is what the tractor was for. So his life effort. I won't say it was a failure. That would be wrong. But it was based on false promises. His health never recovered from his endeavors. When I met Bjorn and his wife Anna in the 80s, they had, they had become yet another number in the statistics of centralization of North Norway and moved to Botsfjord and left the house behind as a farmhouse that they occasionally visited it with a great affection. And I wondered, why do we always go here on Sundays and bring coffee and waffles and cakes? But now I understand. His back never healed. Um, so, I'm interested in the field and attentive to the traces of futures that never came to be. I search for thicker 
ethnographic descriptions through the landscape itself. Or like this in an old school building in Syltefjord, which is now turned into a kind of museum a few weeks each summer, where these handmade maps from the 60s or early 70s still colored the walls of the corridors. And there are probably about 10 of these maps. And they lay out the entire local area with little wooden, wooden uh, sign, signs glued on them that tells such detail of local places that are names I never hear. And they don't talk about it anymore. But here there's Slav and Coleman and there's all these places where you can go and find food and do things. Uh, so this is an archive too of names that are now in use. And to the right, you see, they have gathered uh, all these tools no longer in use either in, the, uh, in one of the classrooms. So through this backward collaborative journey, with Vibeck as my guide, I keep on working on this. The ethnographic present expands and falls in layer upon layer, such as pits for catching reindeer from the 1700s, rusty tools, hidden texts, and Bjarne's tax returns since 1949, carefully kept in the cardboard box that she suddenly found too. Fantastic material. He called himself he didn't know what to put the first year. And, you know, you're supposed to put yrke, occupation. And what are you in Finnmark in 1950s when you aren't really paying taxes yet so much? And you're doing all sorts of things. Well, he put, I can't translate it, fra <laughs> okay. So it, it means from birds to, to fish, but it actually also means in the colloquial um, anything. Yeah. But later, Later, a few years later, he calls himself Bureiser, and I'll come to this in a moment. So, um, the landscape is an archive, but so is it the house, its living room walls, and the basement, and the archive also a social change. In the special issue on multi temporal ethnography from 2013, Stefan Dalsgård and Morten Nielsen point to the lack of attention to temporal aspects of what constitutes the ethnographic field. They propose more attention to a. how anthropological subjects think about time, and b. how temporalities of fieldwork itself, its rhythm, its length, and, and, and so on, uh, matters. And that would include, of course, the return to the field four years after that, you can understand what I'm doing. And it may sound as if I'm ad advocating the latter, but I really am not. It's, it's a privilege to be able to even go back anywhere after 40 years. And I'm not saying that's what you should all do, really. I want to argue something else, though. I want to argue for an even more radical interpretation of multiple ethnography. Multiple te multi temporal ethnography, for me, should be much more ambitious than that. And here I draw on Tess Lee, an anthropologist from Australia, who suggests uh, um, uh, that multi-temporal ethnography must pay attention to enduring materialities and the shifting conditions of possibility and hope that are physically present in the field but often escapes our ethnographic attention. So, in order to understand the um, shifting uh, conditions of possibility and hope, we will need to move away from Sylvifjord and turn to Pasvik again, and the 1930s era of Bjurising. This is the only uh, alea, I think, in Sørvarangir. <laughs> um, squeezed between the Norwegian borders with Russia to the east and Finland to the west is Pasvik Valley, so it goes down like this. And in the middle of the Pasvik Valley, there's Svanvik and there's Svanhund. Svanhund built in the mid 1930s. Svanhund Forsyk Skor, Svanhund State Demonstration and Experimental Farm, is a testimony to the Norwegian state's effort to expand agriculture in Finnmark and to coordinate an ambitious program that aimed to transform marshland and tundra to fertile agricultural fields. And I'm taking you back and forth in time now. This is the 1930s. This is just a few years after the Skål Sami probably had their last winter settlement right here, okay? And, and they had, and their houses were still burned down, but it, the land was empty from the Norwegian days. It was, of course, not empty because reindeer were grazing here. 
from other from northern Sami rangers is a little complicated. But it looked empty, okay? It was not yet occupied by the Germans, so it was between those two ovens, right? These fields would in turn, they hoped, provide livelihoods for hundreds of families of an ambiguous Norwegian sentiment, as I said. More than agricultural cultivation, this, this policy and huge project is social and cultural engineering through irrigation, through artificial fertilizer, through the tractor and the plow. And um, there are kilometer after kilometer of canals like this necessary to, um, to make a field look even anywhere like a field. This is not as uh, hopeless as it seems to you because the topsoil is much thicker. But the, the, the marsh is also very complicated to, to, to work properly with. And um, yeah, the, the work of even making the canals is, is, is extraordinary. Initially referred to in the Norwegian parliament in the 1915-1820 as inner colonization, later referred to as food rising, this policy irreversibly transformed this Arctic landscape and had ripple effects across the entire region, including Syltefjord. And what was at stake here was not only to bring food to poor people in the 30s, it was also that. But it was, as, uh, it was about making civilizing Finnmark, making it Norwegian. Its mon monumental size and architectural style here of Swanhold that you see are testimonies to the colonizing ambitions of the Norwegian state, as well as signifying national sovereignty in a multi ethnic border region. The sensibilities that transformed marshland were fueled by imaginaries of progress and order, underpinned by Eurocentric narratives of cultivation, agricultural cultivation, as a marker of civilization. You wanted to develop Norway? You, you create agriculture. Okay? So we did that already in other parts of Norway, and uh, you have heard about Molsel and you have other places also much further south. But um, in this particular region here, it takes on a, uh, uh, a rather different turn. So, since the 1930s, Swanholm has reinvented itself several times. Now it is the offices of Nibiu. But the basement of the Swanholm building still contains an archive of sorts. Wrapped in grey paper, wafer thin documents registered colonial visions of a future that also never fully came to be. And I, as a little anecdote here, it was only thanks to Corona actually that I that I did this work in the archive, which turned out to be extremely uh, important for me. Um, I, was, uh, I had known for five years that there was an archive, and someone had shown me and said there is an archive in the basement, and somebody ought to look at it. Nobody has looked at it. And then came Corona, and in 1920 I could no longer travel to Finnmark, because you remember there was a lot more smita in the Oslo than in Finnmark, and I couldn't bring really people there, I thought, at least I'll have to go into quarantine. So I went into the archive instead and traveled there uh, for two weeks uh, with an assistant and she, she stayed on and we went through this archive which is amazing um, and tells the story of the Buddha rising from the 1930s. So the uh, short story here, uh, it was abruptly ended by the on onset of the Second World War. The agricultural cultivation later declined but the layered landscape remains as a reminder of agricultural aspiration as well as the German occupation and here again it's, it's a layer upon layer of first the, the Samigon and then the Budaising efforts and then the German occupation that ruined the previous and so on. And it goes on top of each other. So here in the archive I try to assemble fragments of hope, patchy remains in the landscape that holds the legacies of multiple life forms. And because the archive is a landscape too of sorts, a specific kind of materiality sorting and ordering the world and its people, sifting papers carefully, some carefully folded, others stacked on top of each other as in this Uncle Tuka cardboard box. You can kind of see the archive as a story of, of a process of trying to remember something, holding something in place or evaluating something as important and other things as less important than to be thrown away. The protagonist of this story from the 1930s is a Norwegian man called Sven Musling, who led the Stockholm from 1929 until the outbreak of the Second World War. The archive is much longer, but when I, when I looked at the archive from the 30s, I realized that Muslim is not only a very clever and hardworking man, 
He's also a man, I think, I can imagine him as someone who, who, who has almost envisioned a person like me in the future, looking back. He wants to, he wants to write what's happened, and he wants to create a nice picture, of, an important picture of what he's doing, yeah? And later, there were other people took him over, kind of tried to, you know, tried to have some order in their papers, but you know how it is, you don't always collect things. But he, he was careful. His, his history should be written someday, you know, but he thought so, I'm sure. So, Svadi Muslim had already made a name for himself as a manager of colonization projects in the South America. They called it colonization. In an article in the magazine New York, New Soil, in 1930, he describes his first encounter with the Pacific Valley as follows. And I think this is another Kalikuli life moment, okay? He says, when you have traveled around the coast of Finnmark, and suddenly find yourself in this beautiful place, Boswick, it is as if you cannot believe your own eyes. Low, serene, forest-covered hills, no mountains, absolutely no mountain tops, but great wetlands, lakes, and the majestic river Poswick running gently through the middle of the valley, wide and calm. And then he continues with this. This is where the Norwegian state has sent us to set in motion the biggest colonization plan this country has ever seen. There were vast areas to overcome, wet plains as far as the eye could see and so on. Often I had to climb tall pine trees to get an overview of the terrain, and I have to confess that once I managed to get on the top, I often remained there perhaps too long, beholding the lovely panorama. As it turned out though, the colonization project was more challenging on the ground than from the treetops. Swampy, impenetrable marshland was just one challenge. So the solution partly was dynamite. There are pictures of men standing this deep in, in, in water, and in the canals, with, you know, it's on the spa bit. And, uh, I don't know, it's hard to imagine. But uh, challenges can be overcome. And that was the, the impenetrable marshland was only one. With what he called, what Muslim called, a practical eye, and with soil samples, he classified the distinct types of marshes according to their suitedness for agriculture. Soon canals crisscrossed the landscape, bogs were drained, trees were felled, houses were built, and people were given a plot of land to start their life as a Buddha city. But who were these incipient farmers and where did they come from? I'll get to that in a moment, but to kind of understand this, we have to engage a broader constellation, such as what sort of problems was this colonization project supposed to solve? What did it take to become a proper Norwegian Buddhist in the 1930s? And why was this particularly sparsely populated northeastern valley of Norway such an interest to Norwegian authorities? And the answer to the last, uh, to the red question there, is partly about well, the answer is partly about self-sufficiency in Norway and agricultural cultivation as a project of civilization. This is a sort of background to this, I think. But in Poswick, the purpose was also geopolitical. Poswick would be an easy military target for expansive foreign neighbors to the east, Finland and Russia. And in the 1930s, it was only Finland. This, this is part of, of Northern history that is very hard to get right because it changes so much. But just between about 1920 and the war, in those 20 years, uh, um, Finnmark, so we had no border with Russia. We, it was Finnmark, uh, Finland, sorry, Finland all the way out to, to the coast. And uh, there's something called Stur, Finn, uh, the, 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 there, were, there were ideas in Finland about expanding, okay? But I, I think historians had never really confirmed that this was really a threat, but it, it was seen as a possible threat by some at the moment. And, um, yeah, for example, the chief military, the, the military chief of the Barangir Batalingun. He had nothing to do with the Buddhism project, which was really a project of agriculture, but he intervened and he argued that uh, a representative from Barangir Batalingun should have uh, 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 be, be represented in Buddhism Senda, that were to decide what was going on with the Buddhism. You know, so it's, it's very tight actually. And he wrote a very angry letter one time that I read in the archive casting doubt of the loyalty of the Finnish-speaking population. And Pasvik at this time was Finnish-speaking. It was Finnish people, it was Norwegian descent, Norwegian-speaking too, and Sami speaking It was all the mix. And, and but the majority, the major language was actually Finnish. And Norwegians who moved there, they usually learned Finnish, but they, they were very fluent in several languages. 
So this was a worry. And so the Royal Battalion chief said only Norwegians of pure descent should be allowed to have land. Okay? Um, this wasn't radical in the, in the 30s because in 1910, uh, or in the subsequent laws from about 1900 to 1910, uh, it stated very clearly that in order to get a contract, to get, get a piece of paper that gives you the right to own the land that you occupy, which was done in Finnmark at the time, you had to speak Norwegian. Okay? You cannot be only someone speaking. Yeah? So this was normal. But they, were, but they said, uh, of pure descent. That was a little addition there. It was blood. If they cannot be found in Finnmark, they must be found elsewhere. And the Pacific inhabitants, as I said, were often of Finnish descent, and Finnish was generally spoken in the area. Sami were sort of on the side here. They were perhaps less suspicious in regarding the war, but in light of the racial theories of the time, they were deemed simply unsuitable for the task, and they were soon going to die out, you know? That was the idea of, the, of the, some of the scientists in the 1930s. They were, they were inferior, so they would be overtaken anyway. So it wasn't like you had to do anything, but they would slowly become Norwegian. So reports in the archive describe Sami as untidy and sloppy and lacking the capacity for proper farming, just because they're Sami. Um, so what you see here are some other images from the time. And I said sorting people sorting land here. You see the proper Buddha I said, uh, over there to the right, and you see the, the people that are found lacking <laughs> on the left here. Uh, anyway, what Mosling saw from the top of his pine tree was not just the beauty of the Pacific Valley, but Finnmark's potential as an agricultural resource. What the Norwegian authorities saw was an opportunity con to control and cultivate an unruly border area and securing a strong Norwegian nation. The Buddha's project entailed an ordering of people into hierarchy based on ethnicity. So this is where I differ from Bart. You know, ethnicity isn't only, only made through two hands clapping. It can be made at a very different level. The cultivation and ordering of the landscape as well, as a couple, was linked with the land's potential as an agricultural resource. But then, boom, 1940, German occupation. Many thousands, many, many thousands of soldiers were stationed in this region in Palsvik, and they occupied Svana as anything else. All, that, all the good houses were taken. Transforming barns to stables, plowing fields, using plowed fields as paddocks for horses, and all the brutalizing efforts came to a halt without really, ha without really having really gotten onto a good start. There was disruption, there was scorched earth, as you know, there was forced migration later, and there was massive loss. There wasn't scorched earth here though, because the Germans fled. But the, all of Finnmark was, was just completely transformed. And I think we have completely underestimated the importance of this for Norwegian history, but that's, that's a, for, for, for ethnicity today. But that's maybe another, another discussion to have. When the German soldiers had retreated, and when the refugees had fled, and began to return in 1946, and build up North Norway, build up the coasts, many people stopped being Sami. They stopped being Sami. It was easy. All of a sudden, it was easy. Easier. One of them was Vivek's mother, Anna. She had grown up in a Sami settlement, but after the war, as a married mother, she was Norwegian like everybody else, and Saminess was no longer part of her social identity. What is an identity anyway? Well, it was erased and it was silenced in the family, even for her children. And the idea of farming continued, such as in Sifli Field, and sometimes I wonder also how important is Norwegian, is Norwegian as a, uh, the assimilation, the Norwegianization, how important is that for Bjarne's wish to become a good farmer? You know, there is, there is something going on here which I think should not be overlooked either. So the idea of farming as a good life, even in the Arctic, this is the backdrop for Bjarne's efforts. And, um, okay. We'll go back to Sultifuria again. And uh, this is again September this year. And this is Sultifuria Nature Reserve. It's very beautiful. And it looks nearly untouched for any of us who go there, of course. But it is not. Uh, and it's a little unfair that people who live in these places and don't leave a big uh, footprint are, you know, sometimes it's taken away from them because they have been careful. 
This is Oster, the biggest husband, a couple of months ago in September. He has scanned the old photographs that I showed you before onto a piece of paper. And now, one more time, we want to go together to this area called Moon to look at it. We've been there before, they have been there many times. Uh, and by comparing the shape of the hills in the background with the, those on the picture, we try to locate exactly where the proud fields must have been because, you know, we make a dream, but she was very young when this ended. She was only, you know, a girl when it sort of ended. Um, so we're walking around this landscape, it's a very cold day, and we find things. The remains of a small hut, Slottehytta, used for the long day. So work this is about four kilometers from her house, so it was necessary during chilly summer days. And maybe because I said this, ten years after he stopped working the field, one day he went up and burned the hut. You're sure remembers that. Ten years later, I wonder why it took ten years? And I wonder why he did it? Was it, at least, is that how long it takes to give, really give up hope? Or was it a kind of monument of its own failure that needed to be erased from, from the landscape? I don't know. Maybe it was just something he did. And this, we find things like this, a frying pan and stuff, you know. Um, and then we keep on looking. And this is what the field looks like from the nearby road. This is the plowed field that you saw in the picture. It's heather and marshy patches, just like everywhere else. Who would think that anybody, no wonder it's untouched, you know, who would think that anybody had ever had a field here? But we, we, were, we climbed up the hill in the back here, and we walked slowly towards the right to get a glimpse of the fallow field from various angles, and all of a sudden something extraordinary happened. I did not photoshop this. <laughs> <laughs> and we were shocked. This unfolded right in front of us. And I think that plants are opportunistic creatures. They know their soil intimately. And so landscapes then can recall and reveal what people prefer to keep hidden from you. Landscapes are relational archives, material forms, but dynamic and changing, just like people. So this snapshot in September was entirely unexpected for all of us because they really have never seen for all these years, never seen any sign of the, you know, the, of the field as such. Um, and we think maybe that it's visible like this, maybe for only a very short window. In the fall, when the plants turn red, and because they're different plants, they turn at slightly different times. So that the uh, uh, multi species aftermath of a plow and the artificial fertilizer in forms as a difference of color. And the boundary between wild and cultivated becomes a sharp line across the landscape. It is extraordinary, and I hope to work with botanists to analyze this in more detail. If you are interested in understanding social change, then these opportunistic non-humans, like the Kalikuli lambs, should be part of ethnography too, as participants and witnesses of social and cultural change. They are there for us if we let ourselves be moved, affected, as Bart did in that beautiful little moment in the film. So I have argued against the evidential <coughs> optimism that I think is evident in the work of Friedrich Bart. But at the end of the day, I'm not so pessimistic either. We just need to be bold and self-critical, which Bart also insisted we ought to be. Never trust our first hunches, Never totally trust our material or our methods, but push the boundaries always, even if they lead, sometimes as like here, towards the edges of our own disciplinary comfort zone. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.